Hey, howdy. Hey, my Bruin brothers and sisters. Greetings, cretins. How's it going, John? It's going well. It's going well. It's a <clears throat> nice, warm, sunny afternoon here in Southern California. I understand they're having freezing rain and snow in various parts of the country, but uh, pretty <laughs> nice. Where you're at. Now where I am. You yeah. come from freezing rain and snow parts of the country. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I kind of miss it. You know, small amount, but uh, <laughs> not today. Today's pretty pleasant. And yeah, people talk about California and they're like, oh, I don't know. Uh, I wouldn't be in California with all the earthquakes and all that. And it's just like, just <laughs> fires and that. I mean, really, come on. Yeah. And for all the fires that we've been having this year, <clears throat> we it makes up for it with just all the beautiful weather that we have. Yeah. Really is really is a glorious place. Yep. Speaking of glorious places. Indiana. Right. Right next to our good friend, John Blickman. That's right. Hanging out with John Blickman is a, is a glorious place. Yeah. Many good times to be had in Indiana. I can remember several. Um <laughs> That's when, when I think of John Blickman, I think of having a good time. I do. He is, he is a, a fun dude to hang out with and a, a, a great dude for uh, creating amazing uh, brewing equipment. Yeah. You know, uh, just uh, everything from, uh, you know, your more uh, uh, standard basic uh, brewing equipment up to, you know, just the really high end stuff including, uh, you know, uh, stuff. If you, if you want to become a commercial brewer, if you want to brew at that scale, yep. uh, Blinken engineering has got you covered. They do it all from little stuff, uh, three gallon up to, uh, uh, five barrel with the Blickman pro. Yeah. Yeah. Turnkey systems are in very well, very well designed. Yeah. Uh, and you know, it's all by that great guy who's paid for the show for a couple of decades. So you haven't had to, uh, you know, uh, do me a favor, send them an email, uh, feedback at blickmanengineering.com. Tell them how much you appreciate he's been paying for the show. Uh, and, you know, check out uh, some Blickman gear next time you're, you're up for a piece of equipment. Uh, you couldn't uh, be buying from a, a nicer guy. Well, let's see here. Speaking of nice guys, uh, Ryan asks. Ah, our good friend Ryan. It's, it's just, yeah, it's, it's you know. The one Ryan we, we know. Yes. Right. Yeah, it's, 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 it's that Ryan. Uh, he says, hey, guys, there's a dis distillery in my town, Longmont, Colorado, near Boulder, that has some 15-gallon bourbon barrels they're trying to sell. I just listened to some of your, your older shows going over barrel aging, but I wanted to ask how many times you, can you uh, age a beer in a bourbon barrel? I'm relatively new to brewing, so for now, I wouldn't be doing anything too exciting with it. Probably just some dark ales. Thanks for the show. It's been extremely helpful and inspiring as I descend down the rabbit hole of brewing. <laughs> yes, welcome to the rabbit hole, that's for sure. Right. Um, man to fish, each man <laughs> to brew, and just ruin his life. Yes. Yeah. Um, 15 barrel, or sorry, 15 gallon uh, barrel. That's uh, that's a good size that's uh, not too not too large um you can use a, a barrel like that um you know it, until it becomes contaminated if it becomes contaminated well even after it becomes contaminated uh you know you can always uh, treat it with hot water and yeah. uh you know kill anything and start over the the thing about bourbon barrels um generally at least for me you can only use them once in order to, when you're, when you're looking for flavor extraction to develop that okay. bourbon flavor. Um, that's all, you know, cause, cause of the way people expect bourbon flavor, you could use it a second time, but the bourbon flavor is going to be far lighter. I okay. mean, it, it's going to be subtle and you're going to get a lot more tannin and, and wood bite out of it. Um, so here at Heretic, we never, well, we will use them the first time for a bourbon forward beer like Incubus that we do. Okay. 
then we will use them a second time for something where the bourbon is just kind of a subtle background note. And really we're looking more for the oak and the tannins Okay. and we'll, you know, hit it with bugs and we'll, we'll make something like uh, twig and berries, which is a second use bourbon barrels uh, with, um, uh, I think we put uh, torment in there, which is a Belgian strong dark bourbon okay. barrels with elderberries and oh. it, it sits in there a long time. It's a, it's a 10% beer. So it's very difficult to sour. Mm-hmm. So we, we add uh, souring organisms. We add bread, we add, uh, and we leave it in the, the barrel there, you know, for a good year plus, and then we add the elderberries. And so it takes quite a while to develop that, but we would never try and do just bourbon barrel beer in a this bourbon is... barrel a second time. The, the, okay. the variance on the flavor is going to be so huge. You're just going to be disappointed with it, I think. Oh. I remember doing the, the barrel aging show that we did. Uh, you said that uh, generally use wine barrels because they're much sturdier than bourbon barrels. Oh, yeah. Uh, bourbon barrels are really thin. Um, so they're not as durable. Um, wine barrels tend to be, you know, substantially thicker. Uh, so you'll get more oxygen ingress. Um, if organisms are working their way through the wood to get into your, your precious liquid, uh, they'll get through a bourbon barrel much faster because it's thinner wood. Okay. Um, but, you know, uh, also, you know, the amount of oxygen that gets in is greater. Yeah. <coughs> so, okay. Yeah. Interesting. But uh, yeah, I mean, you certainly could use them again. And, you know, again, I'm, I'm saying uh, you can't really use them to get bourbon flavor again. Okay. Uh, you can use them to, you know, make other things like a sour beer or, you know, just an oak age beer with a subtle amount of bourbon. Like a vanilla porter or something. Yeah, sure. Uh, there was uh, back, back in the day when... Uh, you know, people first were doing bourbon barrel aged beers um, up here. Um, uh, I think it was, uh, it was up here. It's one of the breweries up here. And they would, um, they told me they did was they would age beers in the, in the barrels twice. And they would, they would use a barrel twice. Okay. And then get rid of the barrel. And the, the twice was they'd get the first one and then they would blend it with the second one. So uh, they're trying to, because of the cost of the barrels, they're trying to extract as much of the barrel character as possible. And then just blending it to get a flavor that they thought was the best. So, okay. you know, even, even, you know, then I, I've never heard of somebody try and use it more than once for the bourbon character other than blending it back. Yeah. You know. Good to know. Good to know. So, but certainly you can use it until the thing falls apart. Till, as long as it's holding liquid, you know, no matter what happens to it. And you, know, you can uh, fill the thing with uh, uh, really hot water. Uh, be very careful. It's extremely dangerous, but you could fill it with, you know, uh, we have 180 degree water sitting around. So, We'll fill a barrel with that and it makes it hot to the touch on the outside. Hmm. Well, Matt, uh, <laughs> hot to the touch on the outside. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it essentially kills the, everything that's in there. It's, it pasteurizes that. So um, that's, you know, you start over fresh and you, what you just get is, you know, wood character, not very much wood character. Eventually they go neutral. Okay. Just, you're just using it for the, uh, you know, oxidative staling type of thing. Okay. Uh, let's see. Tom, he writes, hello, I just wanted to share something in reference to a comment made about barrel aging that I recently heard during the three part series. We did a three part series on barrel aging. Yeah. Yeah. We really stretched it out. <laughs> <laughs> We milked that for all it's worth. Here we are back, back with questions. 
Uh, let's see. Uh, I agree that aging clean beer without yeast sediment in the barrel for an extended period of time is necessary to avoid off flavors from the dead yeast. Okay. He agrees. However, however, I have had tremendous success following an old English tradition of adding dates and figs to barley wine at the end of the aging period. I take a few pounds of each and boil them down with sugars or to boil them down with water. It's a giant paragraph here, Tom, break it up. Uh, boil them down with water to make a sterile puree and add that into the barrel with some fresh yeast to help ferment out the freshly added sugars. The new fermentation period is uh, supposed to drive out oxygen that moved in and then freshen up the stale beer. It takes about six to eight weeks for the 31 gallons of beer to return clear again before I keg it. I have not noticed any off flavors from the yeast cake that forms within the two month window. Not sure how quickly the dead yeast starts to break down, but for me, two months has been working. Thanks for all the shared information. I found the three part series informative. For reference, I used 30 gallon barrels from uh, Koval Distillery in Chicago that were used to age rye whiskey. I have three barrels and use each one three times before the oak flavor is no longer present. Now the oak is gonna last longer than you know any bourbon or whiskey flavor. That goes right. out pretty quick, but you'll, you'll get oak for you know three, three or more times, um, depending on how, what type of beer you put in there, how long it's in there. Uh, the first batch I'll age for nine months, the second for 12 months, and the third for 15 months. Wow. However, that is kind of pushing it. The third batch, I uh, will have to add some oak chips to get the flavor uh, profile where I want it. Uh, Tom, that's, that's uh, interesting uh, information, Tom. I yeah. like that idea of adding the, uh, the dates and, and figs and such and uh, to... Uh, like a barley wine or something after aging uh, and adding fresh yeast. You know, we've talked previously about how adding fresh yeast to a barrel aged beer, to a stale beer can brighten it up and remove the staling. Uh, you know, uh, Brett definitely does it. Um, you know, I imagine other yeasts will as well. So I think he's right. If you could add, uh, you know, more sugars and an active fermentation to this beer that's been aging for some time, You'll still get some of that aged character, but it, it will brighten it up, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. I imagine the uh, the boiled figs and dates add some some deep, fruity fa flavors and so on. Mm -hmm. some, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, because that's kind of the flavors you're going for yeah. you know, in, 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 the, in an aged barley one. Sounds delicious. Yeah. I think we should start requiring uh, people when they submit questions to submit beer samples with them. Huh? Yeah. 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 Just don't use UPS. We haven't had good luck with them. <laughs> right, right. We've been getting beers for shows, then, then they show late. up like a week week after the show. I'm like, yeah, that ain't working out. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's fascinating. I it, it makes me want to uh, uh, add some uh, dates and figs to a barley wine in a barrel. See, perfect for my new uh, little five barrel brewery. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Something that... Come up and I, I could bring some dates with me and we could, we could bring. Right. You mean, you mean the, the fruit, right? Yes. Yes. The fruit. Definitely. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's do this. Let's take a short break. When we come back, we'll have more of your questions on barrel aging right after this. All right. We're back. Uh, we're talking uh, barrel aged uh, beers, barrel aging. We, we, apparently, we did a really nice uh, three part series back in the day. I thought uh, you did that a very good job on that. <laughs> that well, there you go. Thank you very much. Uh, but questions about barrel aging still pour in. Uh, Adam uh, asked Jamel and John first of all, thanks for sharing all of your knowledge. Your balls are huge. Suppose so. I... ACDC has a song by that name. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, but he's talking about, uh, you know, the dances. Yes. Right. Yes. That's right. Yeah. We do have big balls. 
Um, I would love to hear a show on wood aging, chips, barrels, cubes, and spirals. I'd love to hear what oh. both of you have to say on the subject. Thanks in advance. Well, Adam, apparently uh, we we did a show on barrel aging, wood aging. I'm sure we covered wood aging and chips and alternatives back. Uh, just got to search, search the archives. It's only like a thousand shows you have to look through to find the right one. <laughs> This I think is why we did we that see- series last January, though. So, so really, so it wasn't wasn't too long ago. Yeah, seems like forever to me. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, really, this is why we suggest you just start at the beginning, listen to all of them. You know, and then certain things will make sense, like why we are the way we are, why we have gray hair. Yeah, <laughs> I don't I don't see you having gray hair. Why oh, is my hair gray yeah. and yours not? What's going on, John? <laughs> Are you are you doing the, uh, the uh, Grecian formula kind? The, the, you're right. The the men's uh, hair dye thingy. Are you using spray on? Huh? No, I think it's just the lighting in here. <laughs> uh, let's see. Chips, barrels, cubes, and spirals. Uh, you know, do you have a preference, John? I mean, you know, t- taking everything into account. You know, convenience, price. Mm-hmm. Uh, result. Uh, let's say that uh, you know which one. Which one do you do you prefer? You know, I've used or chips. Them. Yeah, um, I think the spirals are a good way to go because they they hold together. You can reuse them. Chips make a mess, and you really mm-hmm. can't. Um, right. I, you know, so. Um, I'm I'm not a a big wood fan when it comes to beer. I'm you know I have a fairly narrow appreciation mm-hmm. of styles uh, for all that I judge. But um, yeah, wood wood aged beer is not my typical favorite. Although you know I do occasionally come across some real winners that are you know are just wonderful. Yeah. Um, but I don't brew many myself. Um, yeah. But I, when I have, I've used chips or um, I haven't, I haven't, when we've done a club barrel, which turned out really well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think in terms of a convenient form to use, I think the spirals would be a good one. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me, uh, I'm with you, John. Chips are just a mess. The way I've determined to use chips when I still have used them is I will, you know, put them in hot water and, you know, boil them or whatever. Just um, you got to keep in tea. mind that, that, you know, chips, they're going to be rife with bread. Most of these wood products have bread in them and, oh. and chips, especially ton of bread. So uh, bread and bacteria. So if, if you don't want that in your beer, <laughs> keep that in mind. Um, but you can pressure cook um, things like that. And you can kind of extract the oak out of them quite well. Mm-hmm. They, they do quite well in extracting oak into water, hot water. And then you could use that to dose your, your beer. And you could try um, extracting them in alcohol, but I don't know. You know, that does sort of work. Um, the, the you can, you tend to get more, more of the alcohol character from the chip than you do the oak character. Right. I think. Um, cubes. I really like, I thought cubes are really convenient. They weren't very expensive. You could get them at different levels of toast yeah. and then, you know, you could toss them in through the little opening, um, and they'd come back out easily. You know, you could put, toss them in a carboy and when you come time to dump the, the tube and the yeast and all that and the cubes, um, you know, they come right back out. So I, I, I really liked cubes and I thought I got good results with cubes. Spirals, I haven't used a lot of spirals. Uh, the one, they tend to be more expensive. They were larger, a lot of more larger. They, they have come out with more narrow ones that'll fit in the carboys more easily. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think if you have a, a, a barrel that is um, 
not uh, very oak forward or you want to develop more flavors so, you know spirals a lot of good surface area and like john's saying easy you know uh, you could reuse them it might be worth cleaning a spiral you know muck off a spiral yeah toast it with a torch or something and then throwing it back in if you're dealing with cubes no bueno you know you're yeah. gonna you know it's just not worth it just buy new yeah Same thing about chips chips are impossible to reuse Barrels themselves, I think, are my favorite, though. It's a problem when, you know, you're working with a large barrel and you want to, um, you know, fill it up. And if you go to a small barrel, you can get too much extraction for the surface, you know, for the, for the beer you're oh, yeah. with. Yeah, so there are a lot of problems. There's costs, um, handling, um, you know. And mainly, I think for a lot of people, it's cost and just the convenience of filling it. So if I was home brewing, uh, I'd, I'd do uh, cubes or spirals. I think you know spirals, uh, especially if you wanted to kind of toast your own and yeah. kind of mess around with you know toasting. Um, then spirals, you know, and a, and a good torch. I think you're you're off and running. Yep. So there you go. Okay. Let's see here. Um, Steve writes, gents, I'm opening a brewery in Northern Alabama. Uh, he said he will send Mufasa a personalized invitation. Being so close to Tennessee, I have access to oak barrels used in the production of bourbon, rum, and wine. Here's my question. Based on your vast experience, or should I say vast experience, uh, what would you suggest placing in the rum barrel? I was thinking a floral saison would complement the subtle flavors of the oak and rum without overpowering them. Your comments and or suggestions would be greatly appreciated. Does rum have flavor? It does, but a lot of it is really just uh, from being aged in used bourbon barrels. Yeah. So I was thinking, I, I, I've had I've had some very nice rums, especially the ones that come from Solaris. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, but I, you know, you so many of the standard rums. It's almost like talking about vodka barrel. You you get some hotness from alcohol, but you really wouldn't get a whole lot of flavor. That being said, I think a floral saison or a, a saison made with um, floral character hops. Yeah, that probably would do well. Yeah, there, there are some rums uh, that are made from, uh, should I say, uh, like like swampy, uh, <laughs> swampy sugars and uh, molasses and things like that that uh, are have quite an intense flavor, and um, and then with the barrel aging. Uh, they develop some really interesting flavors and, and character. And mm -hmm. a lot of it is, you know, the ferment and the alcohols that were produced, uh, you know, the distillation, it really does, you know, create other esters, you know, throughout that. And then, you know, the barrel aging and the kind of the uh, uh, development of, you know, some caramelization flavors from the, the, the toast in the barrel and then the old bourbon barrel that was used. Um, you know, so there's, there's a, a fair amount of flavor that can be developed, but I think, um, you, you know, that's generally not a rum that's made in the U S sometimes it, it is, I guess. Yeah. Um, tends to be more of, you know, some of those, uh, unique Island ones. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, Steve's right. You know, something like a Saison would be a good choice. Um, you know, hmm. if you wanted to go something bigger, maybe something even like a Maybach in a rum barrel or, um, yeah. uh, you know, I, I would, I would tend to, yeah, um, Saison. Uh, what about a triple? A triple? Sure, sure. Uh, Belgian Golden, um, mm -hmm. you know, maybe even wonder if something like a Goza would uh, would work out well. I don't know. Goza works out really well in like tequila barrels. But I think oh. there's some kind of uh, overlap 
uh, you know, between those kinds of characters. Um, it's the salt and lime. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I wonder what else. Um, but yeah, I, I would think, you know, a, a nice Saison would be, would be good. Uh, but something, something blonde, I think would be, uh, be the best, best possible choice. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, let's take a short break. When we come back, we'll have more of your questions right after this. All right. We're back. I want to tell you about my good friends at Brew Chatter out uh, in Sparks, Nevada, right next to Reno. Uh, great folks, great homebrew shop, all sorts of cool things in there. If you wanted to uh, do some barrel aging, uh, they've got uh, chips and cubes and staves and spirals and everything you could possibly, plus the knowledge of, of how to uh, how to make the best of those. So check them out, uh, brewchatter.com. Say hi to RJ and Josh there. Uh, have a beer at their, their fine little bar in there while you're, while you're shopping around. It is probably one of the best uh, homebrew shop experiences, uh, you know, that yeah, you sounds. We'll have to check it out. Yeah, next time you're up, we should go to we should go to Reno. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of fun in Reno, and Reno's a great town. I'm not that much of a gambler, but uh, you know the the restaurants that they have, the food oh, available, yeah. you know, uh, the 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 breweries, distilleries, the you know, they got everything up there. It's just really cool. It's it's. Uh, you know, I wouldn't even, it's, it's not like Vegas. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, it it's, beats the hell out of Elk Grove. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> you just pissed off everyone in Elk Grove. They will hate <laughs> you forever. <laughs> uh, well, they, they, I, sh- I should preface that and say they Elk Grove, you still have one up on Vacaville. Damn, John, what is it? You just hate everywhere that I've lived? <laughs> what, are you, what are you, what are you, throwing shade uh, now? Uh, uh, beer. <laughs> John's gotten drunk. That's the problem. That's the problem. Well. So we, we were talking about beer, right? Reno is quite lovely. Yes. Okay. We we're talking about beer. And, uh, yeah. Check, check out uh, brewchatter.com, uh, our fine, fine new sponsor. Um, you've just got me all verklempt now. I just <laughs> don't know what I'm doing. Uh, if you're listening live, uh, feel free to, uh, to add in your, your questions into the chat. You just, talk, you just type them into the comment section under the video there that you're watching. Uh, the lovely uh, Miss Bebo will... Uh, uh, pass those on to us so we can uh, we can uh, cover your your questions. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, Doug asks, at what temperature did Jamel store his kegs when aging for extended periods of time? Fridge temps, cellar temps, etc. Hmm. Eggs and barrels. Uh, yeah, uh, boy. Um, depends on what we're talking. So if I was doing something like when you're, when you want to age something in a barrel, I've always observed the rule of, uh, 20C, which is something that a lot of people, uh, do, which is, you know, you want to keep it below 20C. Okay. You don't really want to go above that. Um, you don't want wild swings in temperature either. Some temperature variation is good. Helps the the beer, wine, spirit. Helps it breathe. Age. Yeah. yeah. Um, helps the, the migration into the wood. Um, the, the, the thing about it is you, you don't want to go too cold because you're going to arrest any, you're going to slow development. You don't want to go too warm. Um, you can develop certain flavors. So especially when you're dealing with something that's live, if you've got like Brett or bacteria, something like that, it's, it's extra important. Um, if you um, 
are talking about uh, lagering, for example, you want to uh, take advantage of yeast uh, activity in lagering, you want to very slowly drop those temperatures uh, and then you want to, um, you know, a maximum of, you know, three C a day, you want to, um, uh, not go below 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so you want to keep it up around 45, 48, you know, around in there. If you're, you're doing lagering, you know, 45, 44, something around in there, Fahrenheit, uh, if you want that activity. If you are just cold conditioning a beer, um, I generally held them in at fridge temperatures around 36, 38 degrees Fahrenheit. I have cold conditioned stuff uh, down below um, 30 degrees, you know, down around 20, 29, 28 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, our friend uh, Charlie uh, Bamforth is, is a big proponent of cold conditioning and mm -hmm. uh, for, for a number of days uh, will improve a lot of aspects of a beer. So one of the things it does is help drop out, uh, you know, material from the beer, helps, uh, uh, you know, get rid of the, the remaining yeast, things like that. So, mm -hmm. um, makes it very bright and drops the very fine haze that can. Right. Any, any chill haze and things like that, uh, you know, you can hope, hope to, uh, your findings and stuff and get all that to drop out. So, um, extended periods of time. I mean, there were things that I would, store warm as well for, you know, in kegs. So, you know, we talk about barrel aging, um, you know, the same kind of thing applies to, you know, stainless aging, you know, stainless barrel aging. If you have, uh, you know, something in a keg, uh, we do a beer called a Taffel Bully, which is, uh, was actually the first beer we ever brewed. And uh, we would uh, store it in stainless. So what we do is we um, brew a, a kind of a Belgian table beer and uh, ferment it with like 530 yeast. And then we dose it with Britannomyces and then we store it in steel kegs. And we'll keep it in there for a year or more. And the Brett will work and develop, but it has a completely different flavor to it than if you, if it has uh, access to oxygen and something like a barrel aged beer. Oh. So that's one of the things about barrel aging is the amount of oxygen that's getting through and different barrels. One of the reasons different barrels will have different character is because some of them are allow more oxygen through it just depends on the wood uh you know they're all they're all unique uh, uh little little uh precious flowers and each one has its own character and so that can be you know part of the problem is uh you know getting too much oxygen so we would uh stainless age it and it develops a completely different bright character um so that's, that's an example. More funky, less fun funky. How would you characterize it? Less funky, less yeah. funky and more, you know, it's, it's this kind of clean Brett character, which is oh, really yeah. nice um, without, without too much funk. And uh, you know, so you do that without oxygen. Again, you want to keep it, you know, respect that 20 degrees C uh, limit. So don't store your barrels or kegs or things like that where it gets hot. Um, and you don't want to store it where it would get really cold you know, just, you know, uh, living temperatures <laughs> okay. yeah. are best for that. Um, oh, oh I, I lost my train of thought. Uh, there was something else. I don't know. There you go. I'm getting old. Good, good question though. I'm, I'm, I'm wearing out. Yeah, that is a good question. Uh, let's see here. All right. Urban bungs. 
Hmm. Uh, Nelson writes, Hey guys, first off, thanks for all the free info and advice you put out on the air. Keeps me entertained. I am always learning something new. I just revisited the old wood aging podcast for a refresher on using oak. I plan to add some to an imperial stout currently in the fermenter. I'm confident on how I'm going to use the oak, but I have a question for you about another type of wood, poplar. A home brewer friend recently toured through a bourbon, uh, bourbon county, through bourbon country, oh, bourbon country, in Kentucky, okay. and picked up some bungs from a, a few distilleries. The bungs are made of poplar. Yeah. We were thinking about adding portions of some bungs to his imperial stout along with the oak. My questions are, do you think contact with the poplar will add any off flavors? Would we be better off just adding a shot of bourbon? Or are the bungs and bourbon a waste of time? Are we going to get enough bourbon-esque character just from adding oak? Thanks and regards, Nelson. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's an interesting question. Um, the, the bung generally is not, uh, part of the barrel. It's in a, it may have some bourbon on it, but, um, it's not going to give you the oak character that you'd be looking for or the bourbon character that you'd be looking for. Um, it's made of poplar because poplar is a more porous wood and it's, basically use more of it as a spile i would imagine um it's is, fairly hard well yeah but it's it's the softest of the hardwoods com, you know compared to oak it's cheap um, yeah it's cheap and it's and it's easier to form into a bung shape yeah cuz if you're trying to you know uh, crank out tons of tons of bungs they can hammer it in and then thrown away after being used yeah it compresses a little bit so it would you know hammer down and stick in the hole well mm -hmm. um yeah not not i don't think you would look to that for care beer for character for your beer mm -hmm. yeah I, th uh, I think um you know what kind of flavor would you get out of poplar i haven't i haven't tasted much poplar um, it wouldn't be piney. It would just kind no. of be generic woody kind of. I know that whenever I've had, you know, poplar or aspen stored for firewood, mm -hmm. it will get uh, brett and mold in it and smell pretty funky after a while. Mm -hmm. um, not, uh, not a character I would want in a beer. But, yeah. Um, you know, I've had a number of beers where people have, uh, you know, Spanish cedar and, you know, all sorts of other types of woods. And yeah, it's become a thing where um, people are trying to sell us all sorts of different woods for aging beer. And I'm just like, I've never liked any of those that I've tasted. Uh, so, you know, I'm not really sure I want to mess with it. Um, right. it you know, just, just can kind of be an odd, odd flavor. I wouldn't say don't do it, but I'd say make yourself a small, do it in a small batch. Take like yeah. one of those bungs and, uh, you know, maybe fill up a, a quart mason jar and, you know, and then, and then try that and see what you get from that. Versus, That's a good idea. Uh, risking a, a, a large batch. Um, I mean, off flavors from the poplar, um, usually any flavors are coming from, I mean, you know, something like pine. I've, I've had pine aged beers and it's just like that weird turpentine turpentine kind of thing. Yeah. I don't know if you'd get that from Poplar. I wouldn't uh, think so. Or if you would, it'd be at a, to a lesser extent, maybe. Yeah. I, would, I would just be cautious about, I mean, you know, smell, smell the bung. What do you smell? That's probably what's going to be coming off in the beer. What do you get when you smell your bung, John? <laughs> Just pure oak, you know, <laughs> vanilla. Is your is your bung poplar? I don't know. I haven't looked at it. <laughs> Silicone, probably. I don't know. Maybe my bung is poplar. 
Uh, it could be, you know. Uh, it's got its own Instagram account, so yeah. There you go. Uh, it, it's pretty popular. Yeah, so, sounds. <laughs> <laughs> Would we be better off just adding a shot of bourbon? If, if you're trying to get character. bourbon flavor, yeah, yes. Um, in a lot, in a lot of cases, I think you know, especially when, when people are, are, you know, they'll take wood, and um, they will, you know, soak it in bourbon, and then they'll add that to their beer and soak that in in their beer. I'm always just like, well, you know, you just add a shot of bourbon. And, you know, um, I, I tried in the past kind of, uh, cooking down the bourbon, driving off some of the, uh, alcohol before adding it. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, that seemed to work, but you do drive off some of the flavor. A lot of the flavor in bourbon is kind of a caramelized wood, oaky caramelized character. Okay. Uh, you know, some esters, you know, a lot of the mm -hmm. vanilla from, you know, the American oak. Yeah. So I imagine you could, there are bourbon uh, flavoring extracts and stuff that were, where, I don't know how popular this is, but they sell essences or something that you, you take like cheap vodka and you blend it with one of these essences. Yeah. And then you've got yourself, you know, super discount bourbon or tequila or whatever yeah, yeah and i always wondered you know could you take one of those and add that to a beer and thus get you know your bourbon flavor or tequila flavor that way um you probably could yeah probably right could. how good it would be i don't know would it be better than just adding a shot of bourbon uh quite possibly i don't know yeah uh let's see Are the bungs and bourbon a waste of time you're going to get enough bourbon-esque character just from adding oak. That is a big part of the flavor. I did some experiments with uh, tequila at one time. And, uh, you know, a big part of tequila flavor is, is really the oak. And a lot of tequilas are done in used bourbon barrels. So the world works off of used bourbon barrels because <laughs> bourbon barrels, by law, can only be used once. So every time bourbon is set up, it has to be done in a new American oak barrel. And so after that, the bourbon producers, they're just like, I got no use for this thing. So they used to be dirt cheap. You used to be able to get them pretty much for free. Mm -hmm. uh, then they got to be like $25. And then they went up to $50, $75. And at the height of new craft breweries opening, you pay $450, $500 for a, for a barrel because there was a shortage of them. Wow. And uh, then a lot of those places closed that were paying $450 for a used barrel. And uh, the price sank back down. And I think it's ranging right now, you know, about $125, $150 for the barrel. And then if you got to ship it, um, it can be a couple hundred dollars just to ship a barrel. Yeah, because you, know, you can't fit that many on a pallet. You know, it really, really ends up being uh, pretty pricey. So that's you know one of the one of the issues with uh, bourbon barrels. But they used to send them all over the world. They used to send major truckloads of them down to uh, uh, Mexico for tequila mm -hmm. production, and they would buy them for Scotch whiskey out in uh, in uh, scotland and they'd uh they'd send them out for for you know uh wines ports mm -hmm. uh rum everybody was just like they didn't care they just wanted a barrel <laughs> yeah. care what was, you know that that had bourbon in it you know that was not a not a big deal so <clears throat> you know a lot of these things like we we're talking about rum earlier and all these you know there's there's a crossover and i think I think, uh, you know, Nelson's right. A lot of it is in the oak. Yeah. That wood flavor. So, you know, like we are talking before cubes and chips and spirals and stuff. You can, you can do all that. Toast your own. Toast your own bung. Yes. 
<laughs> there you go, John. All right, let's take uh, one more short break and uh, we'll wrap it up after this. All right, we're back. Uh, let's see here. I don't know if uh, you've been uh, missing any questions here or not. <laughs> let's see here. Okay. Mike was saying, I tried to ferment instead of age in a three gallon bourbon barrel, which is a big mistake. Yes. You don't want to ferment in your bourbon barrels or in, in any barrel. Um, I tried it in the past and that was uh, you know, a big problem because what happens is uh, you get just a ton of yeast in the, in the barrel and it, it can be, uh, one, it just makes a mess and hard uh, to clean out, hard to clean out. Uh, so it's always good to, uh, try and, uh, you know, uh, ferment in, in your glass or stainless or whatever, and then transfer the clear beer to the barrel and you'll be, you'll be much better off that way. All right, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. This was a, a, another joy, John, to uh, experience uh, your comments on your bung. Uh, <laughs> Silicone bung, preferred, yeah. Right. Easy yeah, to yeah. clean. Easy, easy to clean. Easy to insert. It takes lube well, yes. Yeah. Go. All those reasons. Yeah. Just like our good friend John Blickman. Exactly, yes. You know, you might uh, send him a nice email telling him uh, how much you enjoy uh, that he's uh, paid for the show. Uh, feedback at BlickmanEngineering.com. Check him out. Uh, check out our good friends at Brute Chatter as well. RJ uh, and Josh. RJ and Josh, yeah. And uh, until then, everybody, we'll, we'll see you next week when we're going to have uh, Michael Fairbrother on. Uh, from Online Google. Meadery. And uh, we're going to talk some mead. And he's sending us some delicious samples. And I know his samples will arrive before the show. That's right. I, I trust him to, to do that. All right. Uh, till then, everybody, Bruce Strong. Bruce Strong, everyone.